So hi, everyone. So I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, it's actually a long time I, haven't, I didn't give a talk in front of uh, such a large audience, and I'm very happy to be here in Paris because uh, I'm actually like, I was born like 30 kilometers from here, so I'm very happy to be here. So my name is Julian Truffaut. Uh, I'm a Scala developer for more than 10 years. And I also do some uh, teaching around Scala and functional programming at FP Tower. More recently, I started a, I started a project called scalajobs.com, which is a, a, a job board and a recruitment agency specialized to Scala. And if I have time, I would like to talk a few words about this project at the end of the presentation. So today, I would like to talk about implicit parameters. And why do I want to talk about this? It's because implicit is probably one of the most scary features of the Scala programming language. And there are a few reasons why implicit are so scary. First, I think, is that this keyword implicit is used in different places and it does different things. So actually, when you see an implicit, you, you don't really know exactly what it does. I mean, at least when you join Scala, you're like, what, what is it doing exactly? The second thing is that implicit are, is a feature that is very specific to Scala. At least, you know, if you come from another mainstream programming language, like Java, Python, Ruby, or whatever, they don't really have implicit. So we don't really have design patterns to you know, know how to use these features. And there is no really books, you know, how to use implicit in Scala. Maybe you will find a blog post. But, but there is a lack of resources around this. So today, really, my goal for this presentation is to answer this question. When should we use, when should we define a parameter as implicit? So when do we want to use this uh, yellow implicit in the slide? That's really the goal of this presentation. So in order to discuss this, first, it will be good to review the different kind of parameters we, we can use in Scala. So first of all, you know, it, it may be you know, obvious, but the simplest and, and the most common ways to define parameters is to be explicit about it. So essentially, you, know, you define a function like full name, and we define two parameters like first name, last names, and essentially when you call this function, you just pass them in the order they were defined. Simple. In Scala, we can also, define, we can also call this function by specifying the name of the parameters, in which case the order doesn't really matter. Now, as I said, it's very simple, but it's really 99%, if not 100% of the cases, we should use this. It, it's very simple, everyone understands it. We have good tooling around explicit parameters, we can track you know, where, the, where they are used. So, in a sense, we don't really need anything more fancy than that. I, I could almost stop the talk and, you know, we could be good. But there are actually a couple of use cases where, when we need something slightly more fancy. So let's review them. Recently, I actually moved to Austria, and something I discovered when I moved there is that when you receive a mail from the post or like when you order something on Amazon, they actually put your academic title in, in your name. So an academic title can be like, you know, if you have a license, like an undergrad, a master's degree, a PhD, but they also have fancy stuff like your magistrate, a diploma d'ingénieur, they have like tons of them. And there are actually rules around sometimes you put them before your name, sometimes after the names. And, you know, it was very new when I, when I arrived there. So let's say that we want to extend our function full name to offer the possibility to supply uh, an academic title. In which case, we'll add a third parameter title, which is an option of academic title. And it's an option because, you know, not everyone has an academic title. And even if you have one, you don't necessarily want to, to give it. You know, you don't necessarily want to use it. And as you can see, when you use this function, you can still use it as before, say John Doe, but you specify none if you don't have an academic title, or you say like some master of science, and then you will get an MSc at the end of your name. Very simple. Now the thing is, we know as you know, the developer implementing this function, we know that most people either don't have an academic title, or they don't want to use it in this function. So it kind of makes sense to, to use a default value, in which case, we essentially, we add this equal none after the definition of title, and this means that if you don't supply it, the compiler is going to inject this value. And as you can see here, we can call full name with John Doe, and without this academic title, 
and the compiler will inject none instead uh, at, at this place. But you can specify it if you want. So really, default values are good when the developer implementing the function knows that one uh, value for a parameter is much more common. Another example for this will say, like, let's say, something where you require domain-specific knowledge. So imagine when you have like a Kafka listener. So if you want to listen to a Kafka topic, you, you need a topic name, you need some kind of you know, connection strings to connect to another server. But you also have tons of parameters, like you know, what is the commit timeout, the polling interval, some sort of stuff on the offset. There is probably hundreds of configurations to tweak your, your connections to the Kafka topic. But you know, most people have no clue which value should you use for a commit timeout. Is it 50 milliseconds? Is it 100 milliseconds? I, I don't really know. So this is where default values are, are a good use case, because the, the person who implements this function is probably a Kafka expert, and he can say, well, for most applications, 50 milliseconds makes sense. So let's specify it as a default value. And if you want, you can always override it if you need to. So really, default values are good when you know that some, the, the, when the person who implements the function knows that some values are much more common. We could also use overloads or as a builder pattern. This is essentially the same thing. OK, so now let's go into the core of this uh, presentation, and let's talk about implicits. So we'll come up with a different example, and let's say that we want to work with blog post. And a blog post here, I define it as a case class, which, is, which has an author, which is a user ID, which is just a string, a title, and a content, the content of the blog post. And let's say that I want to define a method, create empty blog post, where I specify the title and the, the, the author, but there is no content. As you can see, the content is empty. It's an empty blog post. Now, as you can see here, I choose to define the title explicitly. It's a normal parameter. But I, I also decided to pass the uh, author as an implicit parameter. In a few minutes, I will explain why I made these decisions. But before going into the why, I would like to discuss you know, how it works. How do you work with implicit parameters? So when you have a function like this, which has uh, implicit parameters, you can actually pass the, parameters, the parameter explicitly. If you want, you can say, like, you know, create empty blog post, uh, Scala implicit, the complete guide, and pass the uh, user ID here. It works. Now, this is not standard. It's not idiomatic Scala. Normally, when you have an implicit parameter, you're not supposed to pass it manually. Generally, you let the compiler pass the parameter for you. So in a sense, it's like dependency injection. And the question is, how does the compiler choose the right value to pass to your function? How does it do this? The compiler maintains a map. Uh, this is not really Scala code, and it's not where it's done in practice. But I find it, it's a good way to think about it. So let's say that the compiler maintains a map where the key is a type, and the value is a value of this type. So for example, imagine you will have the value, the key will be int, and the value will be 5. Or the key will be string, and the value will be empty string. Or for user ID, we'll have john underscore 1234. So now when we call create empty blog post with just a title without a user ID, what happens is that the compiler actually looks up the, uh, the user ID, looks up the value at the user ID key, and it finds that it's user ID john1234, and it injects it. And this happens at compile time. So essentially, once your program is compiled, it's, it's exactly the same as if it was you who passed the arguments manually. Does it make sense? Cool. Now, next question. What happens if there is no user ID in this map? In this case, when, when, the, look, when the compiler does a lookup, there is no you know, values that it can find to inject into your function. In this case, we get a compile time error that says could not find implicit value for parameter requester ID of type user ID. So this is a compile time error that says, essentially, I don't know which value to inject. Cool. Next, you know, now that we know how the lookup happens, let's discuss how do you actually put values inside of this map? How do you populate this map? 
And this is where we need to use implicit again, but this time before the definition. So here, if you want to see, I said that this uh, variable, this variable requester ID is defined as an implicit, and when you define a variable as an implicit, it essentially injects this value into this uh, implicit map that we've seen before. So now, when the compiler sees uh, create empty blog post, it will automatically feed this value. Now, another thing to know is that these implicits are actually scoped. So it's not like a globally available, they are actually they have a certain scope. So for example, let's say here I, I wrote two tests. So here it's like two unit tests for create empty blog post. And here, as you can see, the implicit is defined within the first test, but not within the second. And what happened is that now the first test passed because this implicit is visible from the first uh, call of create empty blog post. But in the second test, the compiler tells me I can't find this implicit value. So Another important point is that here, the compiler cannot access this implicit. And which implicit does the compiler has, have access to? Essentially, it's like if you were able to reach out to this value requester ID by typing it, essentially, the compiler will be able to put it. That's kind of the you know, rule of thumb. So it means that if we want to fix the issue here, we need to move the implicit outside of the unit test. And in this case, it will be available for the two functions. Does it make sense? Cool. Now, so let's review quickly what we've seen. First, the compiler keeps track of all the implicits available within a scope. Second, at compile time, the compiler injects all the parameters, all the implicit parameters. And if an implicit is missing, we get a compile time error. There is actually a fourth case here, is that in this case, you have two, two values of the same type that are uh, available in the scope, we get a, another compile time error. In this case, we get an ambiguous implicit error, meaning that the compiler can't find out, like, doesn't know which value does it need to select, because it needs to decide which value to select, and it sees that there is two or more values possible. So it needs to be obvious. And uh, so this leads to the rule about implicit. It said, like, within a scope, there must be only one implicit uh, value per type. So this is the important rule when you work with implicit. You can only have one implicit value per type, within a scope at least. Potentially within different scopes, you can use different implicits. But within a scope, it has to be unique. OK, so now that we've seen like, how implicit works, let's review like, uh, a couple of design patterns, if you will, uh, about implicit parameters. You know, when does it make sense to use them in practice? And actually, today, we're going to go through two examples, two different patterns that I think that they are the most useful one. The first one is called the environment pattern. And in the environment pattern, essentially, what, what happens here is that we are trying to, dis to categorize parameters into two, uh, two areas. So you have the normal parameters that you, mean to, that you pass like every time, that are meant to change every time you call your functions. And you have the environment parameters. There are stuff that is kind of constant for a few functions call. So I know it's, it's a bit like tricky. Let's go through an example to, to see how it works. You will see it, ma it makes complete sense. So let's imagine that we work for an application that manages blog posts again. So let's say that it's an HTTP service that manages blog posts. So you have an endpoint to create a blog post, an endpoint to update a blog post, an endpoint to delete a blog post. So what happens here is that, let's say that when you work on the endpoints to create a blog post, the first thing you're going to do in this endpoint is that you're going to first extract the, uh, the token, like the, the user ID who made this request. Because we have an HTTP service, everything that, you know, everything that happens in our service comes from an HTTP request. So we know that an HTTP request uh, is made by a person, you know, like a browser. And this person is authenticated within our application. So the first thing we do is that, for example, we probably parse the JWT token from the HTTP header, and we verify that this person has the right to, to perform the action that it wants to do. But the important part here is that once we extracted this user ID, we mark it as implicit. This is very the important point. Then we have you know, what, what we're going to do with these uh, endpoints. Essentially, we're going to call you know, parse the JSON, then call an API method, this API method is going to 
uh, create an empty blog post, the method that we've seen before, and then save it in the database. And as you can see here, the pattern is that at the entry point of our application, when we receive the request, we mark the uh, user ID as implicit. So we essentially say that within this scope, within this request, this user ID is the author, the requester of the, of the, of the request. And then this, this requester ID is passed implicitly by the compiler. So within the scope of a request, this is the requester ID. Does it make sense? Cool. Now, the nice thing about this pattern is that, first, it reduces the boilerplate. You know, we, this uh, requester ID, we don't need to manually pass it around. But, and the second benefit is that it also brings consistency. You know, we don't, we don't have any risk to, to use the wrong user ID in our request because we don't pass it manually. It's the compiler, we inject this value for us, and we know that it's unique because it's an implicit. You know, if there were two values, then we'll get a compile time error. So there, is two, there are two benefits. First, it's less boilerplate. Second, it's like this uniqueness guarantees that we are sure that the right value will be passed around. Let's have a look at another example for this pattern to, to just you know, understand it well. Let's imagine that we want to extend our blog post with a timestamp. We want to know when this blog post was created. So we'll add a, an instant. Now what we could do is to say, OK, when you call this method create empty blog post, we'll call the method instant.now that will look up the time at the moment this method was called. Simple, it works, that's great. The only issue with this method is that it makes it non-deterministic, because every time you call it, you're going to get a new instant, which means that when you want to write unit tests or like integration tests about your method, you will never know which uh, value will be generated here. It's going to change all the time. So of course, you can you know, work around this. You can, you, know, you can use mock frameworks to you know, catch the call to instant.now and, 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 and change it. It's kind of brittle. You can try to compare all the other fields, but not the timestamp. It's also possible. But I will argue a better approach to this problem is to somehow inject the, the time, the clock, manually to our function. So we could create an interface called clock that has a method now that will return you the time it is right now. And we'll have two implementations of this interface. One that is the real clock, the, the system clock, if you want, the one that actually called instant.now. And we'll have a second clock that is a static clock that will always give you the same result. So essentially, the first clock is meant to be used in your production application, while the second clock is more like for testing purposes. And how are we going to inject this value? Well, what we'll do is that we'll change our create empty blog post method and we'll add the clock in the implicit parameters. So you see that first we pass the author ID implicitly and also a clock implicitly. And within our code, we'll say clock.now. So same as before, except that we're going to use the clock. And now, because we use the clock uh, interface, we can use a different clock in production and one in our test. And how it works in practice? Well, in the main of our application, we're going to define an implicit clock here. So we'll say, within our production code, the clock here is the real clock. But within a test file or within a unit test, you kind of decide, we're going to say, OK, I want to use this particular time for my clock. And you, you know, if you've been using Scala for some time and you use the future API, you're very familiar with this pattern. Uh, future exactly works like that. You have this execution context, which is kind of a thread pool to delegate, you know, to, to execute an action. And quite often what we do is that within the main of our application, we say, OK, for my production code, I want to use a global execution context or some kind of custom execution context that you create. And for your test, either you will use a global one or may, you may want to use uh, one that only uses one thread or two threads. I mean, you decide. But essentially, it's the same principle. You have this execution context that has two versions, one for test and one for production. Cool. So if we review the environment parameters, is environment parameters are static in a given context. So they only change, the, the parameters only change when you change the context. And what's a context? Well, it's kind of you know, variable, it depends. But I find that the two contexts that make the most sense to me, at least, 
is the per request one. So for example, you say, for each request that we receive, either an HTTP request, a Kafka request, whatever, you have maybe a requester ID or maybe a trace ID that you do for open tracing. This, I think, is simple to understand. You know? And another one that I find, another context that I find quite simple, is this production versus test code. And stuff like this, you could have a clock, an execution context, some sort of random generators. As this is just examples. Now, I just would like to give you a couple of advice, pieces of advice around if you want to use this, this pattern here. If you do want to use this, I, I recommend that you use precise types. So essentially, don't use an int or a string, a UUID or a local date. These don't really mean much because, because we use implicit, and implicit, implicit requires the value to be unique per type. It, you need to figure out what is this value. You know, within a context, what will be the default int? We, we don't know. Like, what's a default int? Uh, so that's why it would be better to use maybe a size, or queue size, or maybe a port number, so something like, you know, quite often we call this uh, a wrapper type or a new type. In a sense, what, what I did here in this example to use a user ID may actually not have been very good, because you could have these things that, you know, for create empty blog post that say that it's a the requester ID was passed implicitly, but you could imagine another method in our API will be something like share blog post, where you take a blog post, the, the user ID you want to share with, another user ID that is maybe the author of this request. So in a sense here, it's a bit awkward to have one user ID that is the author, and it's a default one, and another user ID that is actually the, the target of our sharing. So in a sense here, maybe what would have been better is to create this wrapper type requester ID that is just a wrapper around a user ID, and the requester ID is only used for capturing the person who made the request into our, our method. So I would say it's a slightly better pattern. Again, it doesn't change anything. At the end of the world, it's just a string. But, but we use a different type so that the, we don't mess things up. Everything okay? Cool. Now, the second advice I will have for this is to use clear and simple context. So, as I said, per something per the idea is that you need to find out, you know, implicit parameters needs, because they are passed automatically by the compiler. They need to be obvious. They need to be so simple that we don't even bother passing them manually. So, we need to have a clear and simple context, something that everyone in our team understands, not only you. So something like, for example, to say per request, I think it's very simple. Everyone understands that you know, the requester ID is the ID of the person who made the request. Simple. Or something like you know, production versus test. It's, I would say it's also simple. But if you start to have contexts that are like just within this slightly region of the code, it's this scope, and then it's, it's too complex, and it's much better to pass the arguments manually, explicitly. That would be my second advice. And really, I think if there is only one thing that you remember about this talk, is the value of implicit parameters must be obvious. This is really the key point about implicit. Values must be obvious. If it starts to be too complex, if you start scratching your head, say, which value is passed here, then you know, it's probably a red flag. Just pass the arguments manually, and it will be easier for everyone. OK. Now, before I move on to the second pattern, I just would like to mention that if you want to use this environment pattern, implicits are not the only solutions. You could, you know, in traditional uh, functional programming code, there is this notion of reader. And what's a reader? We're not going to go into the details, but essentially a reader is something in the type. So if you see here, this create blog post now doesn't have an implicit parameters anymore. Essentially, the, we, I change the type, and I say that the first part of this reader is if the un define the environment parameters, and the second part of the reader uh, defines a return type. And essentially, when you use a reader, you use it within a for comprehension, and the implicit param the environment parameters are passed automatically. It's a little bit magical. Now, I, I think this pattern doesn't work very well in Scala, because in practice, you don't necessarily have the same environment parameters for all your functions. For example, maybe the create blog post will require a requester ID and a clock, and this one will just require a requester ID. Or maybe you will have another method that requires just a random generator. And if you do this, so if you have different environment parameters, 
then the four comprehension doesn't work. This is because within a four comprehension, everything needs to line up. And again, you can make it work, but then it involves like wrangling the type of your environment, making it smaller, making it bigger, and you end up writing actually more code than if you were passing the argument manually. So I think it's a, comp it's a very bad pattern in Scala, at least. It's very common in Haskell, but in Scala, I think it, we can do better. Now, we can still keep this idea of the reader, and it's actually been used in uh, Zio. And Zio, if, you, if you're familiar slightly with, with it, you know there is several type parameters, and this, there is this R parameter, and R comes from reader. And essentially, this R defines what are your environment parameters, and the tr trick that they came up with because, is to use variants in Scala to essentially narrow down or expand your uh, reader, your environment parameters automatically. So I'm not going to go into the details, but essentially the key point is that instead of manually making your environment smaller or bigger based on your functions, uh, it does it automatically using variance. So it's, I think it's a very clever trick, and essentially it keeps the best of both worlds. Okay. Now let's go to the second pattern for implicit parameters, and it's a type class pattern. So what is a type class? What is the use case for a type class? So essentially, let's say that we want to write some sort of generic functions. Like, let's say we want to write an HTTP framework. And our HTTP framework, we would like to have a function OK that uh, essentially takes some parameters, you know, any kind of parameters. And what it will produce is an HTTP response with a 200 statue code. And whatever we pass as a parameter will be serialized to JSON. This is kind of the API that we would like to create for our HTTP service. Now, how do we do this? Well, in Scala, we can have a method with type parameters. So we'll say, OK, let's define OK. That it takes an A. So A is a type variable. And what the implementation will say, let's return 200. And we're going to serialize the value to JSON. Simple. Now, the only problem with that is that not everything is serializable to JSON. You know, uh, what happens if you were trying to serialize a function? I, I know it's a contrived example, like, but it doesn't make sense to serialize a function. A more concrete example will be like, you know, let's say you, you, in your application you have your domain model, and you may have DTUs for, let's say, your database, DTUs for your JSON API, DTUs for your Kafka library, whatever. Essentially, your domain model, you, you don't necessarily want to serialize it to JSON because this is an internal uh, model. You don't want to share it with the outside world because you, you might uh, actually rename parameters and you want your external API to be stable. So there is a sense to have your domain model non-serializable to JSON and only your DTU serializable to JSON. So essentially, we would like to define our method OK so that only the, the types that are serializable to JSON works, and the ones that are not serializable to JSON fails at compile time. That, that's the idea. So how do we do this? Well, we could define a trait, JSON encoder, and so this is the type class, essentially this trait. And how do you recognize a type class? It's, something, it's a trait that takes a type parameter. It always takes a type parameter. And this type parameter is either used in the input or in the output. And then when we're going to change our method OK so that it takes uh, a value of type A, but also an encoder of type A. And as you can see now, we encode our value within the, within the method. So it works. That's fine. But now we have this ugly API when you say, OK, user, user encoder. You don't really want to manually say you know, which encoder to use. So how do we improve on that? Well, we can use implicits for this. We can say, let's pass the JSON encoder implicitly. So let's let the compiler pass this value for us. And let's define uh, the JSON encoder for user and the JSON encoder for list of user ID implicitly. And, and it works now. So there is a, now we get back this nice API that we wanted. The next issue that we have is that we do need to have this implicit in scope. So where do we define them? We are not going to define them in each like, endpoint in our application. It will be like redundant. So what we could do is to define, like, create a custom object and put them there. And then we could import them, and the compiler will have access to them because they are imported within our code. It works, but again, it's annoying to have this custom import 
to do in every time we need to use uh, JSON in, in our application. And this is where there is a special rule in the compiler for this pattern. So what you can do, if you look at the, the implicit search, it's actually quite complex. But essentially, the first rule is that it looks the current scope. If the implicit is around us, then, then the compiler knows about them. But if the compiler cannot find them around, what it will do, it will look in the companion object of the target of the type class. So if you have a JSON encoder of user, it will look the companion object of the user type. Of the user type. So for, this means that if we define our JSON encoder of user in the companion object of user, essentially it will be kind of globally available. Because every time the compiler will look for a JSON encoder of user, it knows to look up there, to look it up there. Which is nice, because now it means that our code works. We don't need any more imports. Every time you want to say, OK, user, it just works. Nice. This works well, but what about types that we actually don't control? Stuff like, you know, say if I say, OK, of uh, user IDs, user ID is a list of user IDs. So what, what the compiler will do here is going to look up the list companion object to try to find out uh, a JSON encoder for list. And there is no JSON encoder for list in the, in the list companion object because it's part of the Scala standard library. And you're not going to make a pull request to the Scala compiler to say, OK, let's please, for my application, I need a list of user IDs. Can you please add it there? Like, you know, I guess Martin Ogadeski will probably reject your pull request. Um, so yeah, it doesn't work. So we need another solution. So now, what could we do? Well. This is where the second rule that the compiler has implemented, in case you can't find a JSON encoder in the companion object of the list, what it will do is it will look up the, the implicit in the companion object of the type class. So it will look into the companion object of JSON encoder for this. So if you want, within the JSON encoder companion object, this is where we can define all the, uh, all the implicit values for types that are outside of our control, stuff like from the standard library, for example, like string, int, local date, or list. But now we have another problem here, is because a list of what? You know, like, you need to specify a type. So we're not going to say list of user IDs, list of string. We, we can't duplicate everything. So now we need to make this, this implicit kind of generic. So we could say, let's say that it works for all the types if you have a type A, you can construct a JSON encoder for a list of A. But actually, we don't want to do this because not every type is serializable to JSON. Essentially, here we would like to say, I want to define a JSON encoder for list for types that are itself serializable to JSON. So here, this is where we need a second implicit that is here, where we say, this is where it starts to be complex. Here we say, OK. The first implicit is to say, please add uh, a JSON encoder for list into your map. And here I say it's a condition. You say, I only want to create JSON encoder for types that are itself, a, for, for, for elements in a list that are itself uh, a JSON encoder for it. And it works. So if, you, if we summarize it, we have this implicit search that says, OK, first let's look at the current scope. Then looks up the companion object of list. Then looks up the, JSON, the companion object of JSON encoder. And it says, yeah, maybe if you do have a, comp uh, a JSON encoder for user ID, it will work. And then it will look up the companion object of user ID, and it finds it. And it works. So you see, this is, these are the steps that happens when you look up for this implicit. So if we summarize this type class pattern, is really we want to write a generic method, but we want to constrain it so that it works on some types, but not all types. And how this constraint is implemented is by you need to define you have this JSON encoder available. That's how it works. Make sense? Cool. Now I'm going to fast forward because I don't have much time. Uh, toot, 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 toot. We can, so a couple of advices for this. First, I, I argue that it's much. I will try to avoid to define your implicit in custom company, in custom objects. So you could very well say. You know, maybe I have a, a way to encode my user for, my, for this client and another way to, for another client. I think it's a bad idea because if you do this, it means that your code here, OK, of user, the behavior depends on your imports. And I think like the imports, we, we generally don't read them. And it means that you, know, you have like a, quite often like lots of code between this and this to find out what happens. 
I think that when you read code, you should know what happens, and you shouldn't have to check, go back and forth to figure it out. It's very brittle. So that's why I think it's much better, if you can, really try to define them in the companion object of your types. So again, the rule about implicit is the value of an implicit parameter must be obvious. That's, that's the golden rule. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have much time about this, but I would say like, quickly that a counterexample also for, uh, impl for type classes is in the standard library, there is a type class called ordering that allows you to compare two values together to say, is it lower, is it bigger? And it's a type class because it's defined as a you know, trait with the type parameters. And also, if you look at the uh, standard library, it has an API, like, for example, called sorted, that takes this value implicitly. Now, I would argue that it's not a good idea. I wouldn't have done it like this, because if you look at this code, list of 819, and you call dot sorted, what is the result? Do you know? Is it 189? Is it 981? Does it not compile? Well, actually, it's 189, so it does it in an ascending way. And let's say that you want to do it in a descending way. How would you do this? Well, you will have to define a custom implicit somewhere in your code, or probably in the same, same class, and say ordering.in.reverse. And somehow, when you look at this code, you will, you will know that it somehow fetches the implicit in scope, uh, or you could pass it manually like this. In my opinion, it's not a great pattern, because I, when I want to read code, I want to know exactly what it does, and I want it to be clear. And, and the ordering, you know, it really depends on the context. Sometimes I want to use an ascending order, sometimes I want to use descending order, sometimes I want to use a custom ordering, and I much prefer to pass this argument explicitly. I want to be clear about which ordering I want to use. So I would have preferred ordering to be like still a trait, but I would have preferred that sorted the arguments to be explicit instead of implicit. That at least, I, w I, I thought it would be better. But yeah, but generally I would I'd say that passing it implicitly, uh, but even sort by also takes an implicit, uh, because sort by takes a function, but then the ordering is still implicit. Oh, the function is, not, okay, we can discuss it later, but. Uh, <laughs> cool, so now let's review quickly. You have three ways to, to define, th mainly three ways to define parameters in Scala. Explicit, which I would say, use it 99, if not 100% of the time. It's simple, it works great, we have great tooling, it's, it's great. Don't try anything more fancy. Now, if you do have, if you know that one value is much, much more common, you may want to use default value. This is a way to put like, domain-specific knowledge into your function. And for implicit, it's, it's also a good pattern if you want to use this uh, environment pattern that we've seen today, when we want to say, within a certain scope, all these arguments are the same as static. This is uh, a good use case for implicit. Or if you want to write generic functions and constrain the genericity of your function. This, I would say, is another good example for, for uh, implicit parameters. Okay, so I'm late. Uh, I have 30 seconds. I'll just say that uh, if you are looking for Scala jobs or if you're a company hiring people, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, uh, SkyJobs.com is a jobs board and a recruitment agency made by developers for developers. So don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, in the future. Thanks, everyone. Hello. Yeah. What about Scala 3 and uh, all the new implicit K world? So actually, Scala 3 is, is great. Like they, they change a lot the implicit, and, and they actually address the first point that I had about them, where the implicit keyword is used for different things. It's used for type classes, it's used for extension methods, it's used for conversion. And the nice thing about Scala 3 is that instead of using one keyword to do everything, they have different keywords to do each pattern. And I think it's great, so they have like, you have like an extension method syntax, you have another thing for uh, converting types, and, and you have for the, the implicit parameters, they actually remove the implicit or they change it so that they use a new keyword like using and given. But essentially, you can take everything I've seen today, it still works in Scala 3, but they just change like the, the syntax around it for implicit parameters, for the 
uh, use cases, as I mentioned, for implicit syntax, for implicit conversion, it's completely different syntax. But essentially, Sky 3 is very going in the right direction. It's, it's great. So apart from the differences in syntax for implicits in Scala 3, uh, you had one slide that talked about implicit resolution, and yeah. it was like a very straightforward case, but sometimes they get not so straightforward. Is there any like gotchas or differences in the way implicit resolution is done between Scala 2 and Scala 3 that might surprise users or catch users up? To be honest, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, I know one thing that has changed, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that now the implicit works in a different scope. So let's say when you import, like typically in Sky 2, what you do, let's say you use cats, for example. Typically you will say implicit, import cats implicit dot all or maybe dot underscore, I don't know. But essentially when you do this, you import uh, the classes, the types, but you also import all the implicits. I believe that in Scala 3, there is one import for importing the implicit and one import for imp importing like values and types and stuff like this. Now about the resolution, I'm not aware of differences, but don't, don't take my word for it. Okay, thanks. One thing I just would like to mention is that in Scala 3, this notion of type class derivation that I briefly mentioned and slightly skipped to say like, you know, let's say you want to write a JSON encoder for a user and a user is a user ID and, and a string. You know, essentially, if, a user, if you know how to encode a user ID into JSON and you know how to encode a string into JSON, then you know how to encode a case class that has these two things. And that's why lots of libraries in Sky 2 have ways to derive this stuff. Like essentially it's a thing, if everything within your case class is encodable, is like serializable, then the big thing is serializable. In Sky 2 it's encoded via macro, and these are libraries like Shapeless or Manuela that does this for you. But in Scala 3 they built it into the language, and you can even have this very, very nice syntax that I, I, I skipped it, but I think it's great. You can say, for example, case class user derives JSON encoder, and, and essentially it will do that for you. So it, it really captured this notion of type class pattern and, and does you know, all this boilerplate for you. Cool. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>